these are the kinds of trees you want to have. <laughs> Big, majestic. All of my trees are on, call it rented or leased property, but they all want syrup in exchange for the use of the trees. So instead of paying by the tap hole, we figure out the value of that and turn it into syrup and give it to them. So I have to, of course, take all my stuff out every year after season. All the lines and everything come out so that nobody's hindered by you know, anything. Some of these trees will probably actually be weeping today when we drill them. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's a get-rich scheme, because it ain't. <laughs> it is a labor of love. The smell of the sugar house and some of the things that go with it and all the people that come to visit in that, it's kind of irreplaceable. I can't tell you how many people who were thinking about making their own or getting into the business, maybe, um, that I asked, I said, well, before you do that, or take that venture on, why don't you come over and spend some time and watch what we do? And I, I bet you it's been at least a dozen people. And they came and they stayed quite a while. They actually got to see all of the filtering and all the different things that we have to go through. And almost everyone almost used the same words they would finally get up at some point during the night after they'd been there for some time. And, You're crazy. I'm going to buy my syrup. <laughs> That's their basic response. They did not have a clue as to how much work actually does go into it. it it's very labor intensive. No question. Um, it's a lot of hours. <laughs> And it doesn't wait for you. That's the problem. You can't change its schedule. And you only have so much time to get sap boiled in if you want to make good quality syrup. It can't sit forever. This is a vacuum system, all airtight fittings. We have these quick connectors so that at the end of the season, we'll flush these lines out. <laughs> It'll suck your finger right to it. Pretty decent, like it doesn't want to let go. And then I can disconnect them and unhook them from here and they unhook from the tree and we coil them. They're all tagged so we know where they go back next year. Brought in 600 this morning just to make sure we had enough to run and we bring it in in the truck, set the pumps up to pump it across into our milk storage tanks. Goes through a filter before it goes into the tank to catch any bark or any of that stuff. Um, see that one's completely completely full I'm gonna open that one up and let it run over into the other one too the big straight upright tank on the end is where I store the soft water that we separate from the sap with our our old machine for cleaning the machine and for cleaning other things also um, that's full right now, so I'm already putting water on the ground around the front. The concentrated sap after it goes through our RO machine, which we're going to boil then, is being put out that hose into this tank up here on the platform. And that's being fed right into the evaporator. This is the nerve center. <laughs> this is the machine. This is where my sap comes in from the outside tanks. It's being fed into a, a basic sprinkler pump, which pushes it into a high pressure pump, taking it up around 250 pounds of pressure, forcing it through these, the sap through these vessels and the, the membranes inside these vessels. The pores are so small that sugar molecules cannot fit through them. So the sugar tumbles along the outside and comes out one way and the water squeezes into the middle in a core and comes straight out. So the water's being brought out here one way. Concentrate comes out of the first one, goes into the second one, is being concentrated even more. And then comes out in another water outlet for the second vessel. And then it's being fed into the machine. So, And then it'll go up this Christmas tree and on up to the tank on the top or I can send it wherever I want to when I get if I want to send the 
water we're separating out to the tank, I can do that. If I want to send it to the ground, I can do that. If I want to send it down the drain, I can do that. So it's, it's a little bit of plumbing, but it's, it's well worth it for what all we can do with it. I'm taking about 75% of the water right now. So instead of boiling 10 hours, you boil two and a half. You know, it's just amazing difference. That concentrated sap is on that tank on the platform. It's coming in here and we don't, it's very cold. It's probably 40 degrees. So we don't want to put 40 degree liquid into our nice boiling pan or it just goes chook. So what we, we bring it in, it comes up through these coppers, copper pipes, there's a whole set of them across here. And uh, the hot steam going over them inside this hood will heat that from about 40 to 200 and in mine about three and a half minutes. So that when it goes up those, comes out, then it comes out here and is fed into the pans. It's already 200 degrees plus and just continues boiling. It never stops your boil. This float, this is a float underneath here. You can see under here, it's, it's feeding constant. It reads it and lets the appropriate amount in to keep the depth in this back pan. So every four hours or so, we will switch which side we're finishing syrup on, on this evaporator. Right now we're finishing the syrup in this final outside compartment. Later we'll switch and reverse the flow in the evaporator and we'll finish on that one. So that this raw sap coming in from the back pan will clean the scale off the bottom of that compartment. So you just keep swapping back and forth so that you don't get, if you build up too much scale, you burn them pans really quick. Um, I have a temperature probe in here that is reading in the pan, so I know when to stop. It has to be set every day because the parametric pressure is different every day, so it changes the setting of the needles. You won't like it. <laughs> People don't understand <laughs> that there's this much yuck, we call it. It's, it's called niter sand. It's formed during the cooking process. It's uh, slimy, it's worthless, it has no taste to it, essentially. And it plugs up everything you want to filter with. It's terrible. But if you don't get it out, your, your syrup will be cloudy and ugly. And when we get ready to finish, this is the other invention that is probably better than, the, well, as good as the RO, let's put it that way. It's called a filter press. And the, the other way to filter syrup is through nylon or wool bags, which is a absolute pain. They have to hang inside of a, you know, a tank on hooks and you keep pouring syrup in them and it runs through. It does a halfway decent good job of filtering, but they plug up quickly. And uh, after a while, you will start to see settlings on the bottom of the jars. These filter presses, it comes out crystal clear. You can read newspapers through it. Um, it requires, diatomaceous earth. It's almost like flour, except for when you mix it in the syrup, it gets all sticky and milky. And you say, ah, oh, what am I doing to my syrup? You know, but it's necessary for the filtering. It's ancient fossilized seabeds of algae and they have like a real pumicey rock that they grind up. And then for our purposes, for food grade, they purify it. These plates have papers that go between them and the holes match up. So you're going to have a flat plate on each side of that hollow cavity. One here, just like that. So I'm going to leave that open. So the flat plates, when the syrup comes in, it can only go through to the next plate, whatever it is in line with. But these have a hole. The syrup comes in through here, comes up inside, fills this whole cavity with the syrup and that dirt that's, we call it dirt, earth that's stirred up in it. And right away that earth starts coating the paper and starts building an actual cake on there. When we take these apart at the end of the run, we'll have big cakes on the paper that thick of that earth and all of that that it's caught. So, yep, it forms these cakes. And that, if you don't have that earth in there and, and that stuff coats that paper at 100 pounds of pressure, you will not push syrup through that paper. You can't. But that gooey stuff, for some reason, it allows the syrup to go on through, but it won't let any of that go on through. It catches it all. So, And then once it squeezes through 
the paper, it goes into all these little low channels into that flat plate. And the only place it can get out, there's three little holes bored there and three little holes bored there. That's the only access for it to get out of this press. So it has to go through the paper and it has to get into these low channels and go out these small holes. And once it does that, it can go up, up the hose and, and it can either go in the canner if we're doing small stuff or it'll go in one of the barrels. We'll set a barrel here and just stick the hose in the barrel. When I go to shows and that, I can take pictures or take ribbons and plaques, put them on the end of the table for people as they're coming in and out to see what's going on. Is the pretty fancy stuff for the tourists or people that live here that want gifts. I've got a buddy up north that started making syrup because of me. He started much smaller than me. He had access to a lot of trees, so he decided he was going to expand it in about six or seven years he's at 10,500 taps with that many taps now all on vacuum he should make over 4,000 gallons a season so that's pretty good money you know you either got to run big volume like that and try to make it that way or you stay smaller and make quality and and sell it that way and that's the way i prefer to stay